Well, I have to be uh, very careful with this first story that I'm going to tell because uh, it involves some people not from this church but another church and I had to be really careful with the names that I used in this story to make sure that there's no one here by these names so that, uh, that the innocent will not be guilty this morning. But I was uh, hearing this week about a story about a church and in this church was the church gossip and her name was Sarah. I think that's a safe name to use this morning, right? And Sarah would go around gossiping around all these people all the time. And, and most of the people in the church didn't really like that a whole lot, as you can imagine. But they were also kind of afraid of Sarah. Because they knew if they did anything whatsoever, that it was going to be broadcast all over the church. Well, one day a new guy came to the church. His name was George. I think I'm also safe with that this morning. And uh, George wasn't really too scared by Sarah. And uh, one day Sarah got up in front of the church and, and accused George of being a drunk. And she said, George, she said, the other day I drove by the bar and your car was parked out front and we all know what that means. George didn't really say anything. He didn't reply at all. He didn't change his expression or anything else. He just kind of walked off. And that afternoon he went and he parked his car in front of Sarah's house. And he left it there all night. <laughs> now, we're not necessarily going to be talking about gossip this morning, although I suppose it will get addressed somewhat. But we are going to be talking about the importance of appearances. And that's really true for us who are, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, that appearances are important. As a matter of fact, I would say this, that that in general, people are much more impressed by our conduct than they are by our creeds. That for those of us who claim that the Bible is, is God's Word, that it's absolute, that it's powerful, that it's life-changing, that the main way that that gets communicated to other people is not merely through our lips, but through our lives. And that's really the message that we're going to take this morning from from Titus chapter 2 as we continue our study of, of the book of Titus. We're almost finished with our, uh, our sermon series titled Little Books with the Big Message. And we'll actually wrap that up next week. We're in the, the second of three chapters of Titus today. Hopefully you still have it bookmarked from last week so that you can go ahead and find Titus chapter 2. And, and I'm going to read that in just a moment. Before we do that, let me just say this. There is so much in this chapter I mean, there's so much that we could spend literally weeks on this. And, and frankly, I'm not going to have time to cover all the riches that we could mine out of this, just this one chapter of Scripture. And as I was thinking about that this week, I'm thinking, you know, this is probably a, a good place to come back to at some time in the future, maybe even next year, and to look at some of the things that, that I won't have time to cover this morning because they are so important. And what we find here in this chapter, as we find in a lot of places in the Scripture, is that, that Paul, as he writes this letter to Titus, he's going to deal with two things. He's going to deal with the why, and he's going to deal with the what. And this morning, I'm going to deal with the, primarily with the why, because I think in most cases, we need to understand the why before we understand the what. We need to understand the purposes for which Paul is writing here, before we can actually get into the practices that he lays out and, and really be able to apply those in our lives. I find mean, that's often true in our lives, isn't it? That we, we can't really do a good job of applying certain things until we really understand the why behind them. And so this morning, that's where I'm going to really focus my time as we look at Titus chapter 2. So as I say, hopefully you have your Bibles opened up there now to, uh, to Titus chapter 2. And you can go ahead and follow along as I read. As I do that, because we're going to focus on the why this morning, I want, to, I want to encourage you as I read this, think about where Paul's talking about the why here. See if you, can, if you can figure that out. I'm going to tell you there are really three places here, three what I would call purpose clauses that we'll pull out of this passage as we go through there. Here's what Paul writes. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. <clears throat> Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. 
Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people, for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. It's really interesting here that... uh, that Paul begins and he ends this chapter with the very same command that he gives to Titus. Now, if you're using the ESV, that's not really easy to see because you'll notice in verse 1, he says to uh, to teach these things that are in accordance with sound doctrine. And then you get to verse 15 and he says to declare these things. In, In Greek, it's exactly the same word. And in fact, this is one of the places where the King James actually does a better job of translating this because in in both places, it actually uh, translates that speak about. And that's literally what he's saying. So so what he's saying to 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 Titus here, he's saying, you need to speak about these things. You need to continually be speaking about all these things that are sandwiched in between these two commands. And between these two commands, he does two things, as I mentioned earlier. He's going to give them the why, why they should do this, and he's going to give them the what. He's going to tell them how how do you live out your life in a way that's in accordance with sound doctrine. And because we're going to focus on the why this morning, here's the main message that I want you to take away from this passage this morning, and that's this. That Jesus uses changed people to change people. Jesus uses changed people to change people. That's really what we're going to see as we look together in this passage this morning. That, and we're going to see that, that Jesus uses people who have been changed by the gospel as, as his primary tool to help change the lives of other people. As I said earlier, people aren't so concerned about what we believe as how we live our lives. They want to see whether, in fact, this, this Bible that we claim is is true and life-changing and powerful really is by watching our lives and seeing what we do here. And so Jesus tends to use the lives of changed people as one of the primary tools that he uses to change the lives of other people. And we see here why he does that. There are three what I would call purpose clauses here in this passage that we want to look at this morning that tells us why Jesus uses changed people to change people. We find the first one in verse 5. And when we look at verse 5 here, we see that changed people keep the word of God from being reviled. That's what he says here. He he talks about the fact that that the word of God may not be reviled here. That word reviled is really literally, if you have a King James, it's probably translated blaspheme. And that's literally what it means here. He says that changed people keep the word of God from being blasphemed. And a lot of times we think about blasphemy, I think we think about it as being something we say, speaking bad about God, or or somehow with our words criticizing God or who He is, and certainly that's part of it. But what Paul is pointing out here is that we can also blaspheme God by the way that we live our lives. That when we don't live our lives according to sound doctrine, as he says here, that we actually blaspheme God and we we cause people to be turned away from Him 
and from his word here. And so again, we're reminded that, that people judge the validity of God's word based on what they see in our lives. And so that's why Paul is going to lay out here how various groups are to live their lives. He talks here to older men and to, to younger men, to older women and younger, men, uh, younger women. He talks here about slaves, which we can take and apply in the workplace. And all those things are important. Like I say, they're so important that I want to come back and revisit them again at a future date because I think they are crucial. They, they give us a good picture of what discipleship is to look like in the local church. But what I want us to see for now is that the importance of changed lives and, and what the way that that impacts people all around us like that. I read this week the story of an evangelist, and he was preaching one night, and he gave this great message about the gospel. And the next morning, he got on a bus, and he gave the bus driver a dollar. This happened a while ago, because I don't think you can go anywhere for a dollar on a bus these days. But he gave, the, he gave the bus driver a dollar, and the, the bus driver gave him his change, and he looked down, and he realized that the, that the bus driver had given him 10 cents too much. So instead of pocketing the extra dime, he went back to the bus driver, and he said, hey, look, you gave me too much change. Here's your 10 cents back. And the driver said this to him. He said, yeah, I know that. He said, I was at the meeting where you were preaching last night. And he said, I, I decided this morning when I recognized you when you got on the bus that I was going to give you too much change and see what you did with that. He said, I had already decided that if you just pocketed the change, I, I would just figure you were a fraud and I would never see you ever again. But that if you gave me the money back, I would come listen to you again tonight. So because of that 10 cents for 10 cents, that man went back that night and he heard the gospel preach, and he committed his life to Jesus Christ. And the fact is, people all around us, they're watching us. Especially those that know we're believers, and they're looking to see how we're going to live out our lives. And whether we're going to really live them in a way that's consistent with God's Word, or whether we're not going to do that, in which case that the Word of God gets reviled where it gets blasphemed. So if we want to be changed people who Jesus uses to change people, we need to, first of all, make sure that we're not reviling the Word of God. The second purpose clause comes in, in verse 8. And he talks there about how changed people silence their detractors. He talks about the fact that, that if we live our lives according to sound doctrine, that we're going to actually embarrass other people. That's literally what the word means there when it talks about shame. It means to shame them to the point of blushing. And that's what happens, isn't it? When we live lives of integrity, we silence our detractors. The fact is, as long as we live in this world, as long as we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, our, our detractors are not going to go away, are they? But if we live the kind of lives that, that Paul is talking about here, we can often silence them. Some of you might be the fami familiar with the uh, story of Cheryl Bates uh, a couple of weeks ago. Matter of fact, she went into a Staples store in North Carolina to buy some school supplies for her kids. And as she went to check out, the store manager thought that she was shoplifting. She suspected that this lady was shoplifting. And so she, she actually told a police officer that was there nearby that, hey, I, I think this lady is shoplifting. So the police officer approached her. And he said to, to Cheryl, he says, well, you know, what is that under your shirt? And Cheryl said to him, sir, I'm 34 months pregnant with twins. And, and the officer still didn't believe her. So finally she pulled up her shirt and showed the officer her belly. Now you got to imagine that, that that police officer was pretty embarrassed and shamed. I don't know exactly what happened to him. But the store manager, I know, was more than just embarrassed and shamed. She actually lost her job over that. And that's, that's what it's talking about here. We need to live our lives in a way so that when people look at our lives and they try to make accusations against us, that they're shamed because the accusa accusations just prove 
not to be true. There's a third purpose clause here, a third thing that we need to make sure that, uh, that we're doing, and that is that changed people make sound tra- a doctrine attractive. Before I actually get to that in particular, I, I just want to point out here that this is one of those passages where you can clearly see that Jesus Christ is God, can't you? It talks about Jesus Christ, God our Savior. So clearly here we see that Jesus is God. This is one of those great passages to use that people to show people who claim that, well, no, the Bible never claims that Jesus is God. We see it right here. But Paul, Paul kind of now turns from some of the more negative things. He says, don't live in a way that the Word of God gets reviled. Don't live in a way that, you know, that people can make accusations. Now he's going to give something more positive. He says in verse 10 that you might adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a really interesting word there. The word adorn that's used there, it means to take something and, and to put it in order or to kind of put it back to the way that it was. It, it is kind of the picture there. It's actually the word uh, cosmeo is the Greek verb. We get several English words from it that you might rec- recognize, like the word cosmos, which refers to the fact that the world is in, in all its orderliness. The word, word cosmeo really stands in opposition to the idea of chaos, which is just random disorder. And so the idea of the cosmos, the world, is that God took all this disorder and he created order out of it in the world that we live in today. Or the word cosmopolitan, which means kind of a, a citizen of that world. Or even you ladies probably are familiar with the word cosmetic, right? I might get myself in trouble here this morning, but uh, when you got up this morning and you used those cosmetics, did you realize that you were making order out of chaos? That's really what the whole idea of cosmetics is, is to take and make order out of chaos. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying that, that when we live our lives in a way that's consistent with sound doctrine, that we actually make the, we make the doc. the the gospel attractive to the world around us. I was thinking about uh, that this week. And let's suppose that I came to you and I said, hey man, I'm on this really great diet. I found this great diet. I can eat all I want. I don't have to exercise. And the pounds just melt away. And you look at me and you begin to think to yourself, Yeah, right, Pat. It looks to me like you've gained about 20 pounds in the last month. Now, if I tell you about that diet, you're not going to be very interested in it, are you? But let's say, on the other hand, that that over a period of time, I actually eat healthy, and I go to the gym, and I work out, and I actually do lose 20 pounds. And you look at me, and you come to me, and you say, hey, Pat, I noticed you've lost a lot of weight. How did you do it? you think you're going to be a lot more receptive now to listening to what I have to say about my diet and my exercise than the other way around? And the same thing is true with the gospel, isn't it? If we just go around telling other people about the gospel, but our lives don't match up with it, that's not something that's real attractive. On the other hand, if people look at our lives and they see that our lives are changed and they begin to ask us why that is and we tell them about Jesus Christ, Just think about how much more attractive that makes the gospel to other people. And so as I said this morning, I want want to spend this time talking about why Jesus uses changed people to change people because I think that's that's so important. But just because we're not going to focus on the what this morning doesn't mean that there aren't some important applications that we can take away from this passage this morning. And I want to share with you just two, I think, important implications for us that we can take away from this passage this morning. The first one is this, that that we can bring the kingdom of God near to others when we have an, excuse me, when we have an outward focus. Back earlier this year, as we went through the book of Acts, we talked a lot about this whole idea about how do we bring, take the kingdom of God and bring it near to other people? A lot of times we want to use the word evangelism for that, and that's fine, but I think this gives us a better focus. What are we trying to do? I'm trying to take the kingdom of God. I'm going to try to bring it near to other people. 
And if I want to do that, I have to have an outward focus rather than an inward focus. I've been refereeing high school basketball and, and volleyball for quite a while now. And what I've observed over the years is there are basically two kinds of officials. Most officials fall into one of these two groups. First of all, those are, there are those officials who are only in it for themselves. They're in it to make money, number one, a lot of them. Or number two, a lot of them are in it for the recognition. You know, they want to they brag about how many state playoff games they've done and state finals and, and things like that. There's a second group, though, and that second group, they're not in it so much for themselves. They're in it for other people, primarily for the student-athletes that are participating in these sports. And you can tell that by the way that they referee, by the way that they interact with coaches and, and players and, and other people. And you know what I've found over the years is that the best referees almost all come out of that second group. They almost all come out of the second group. You know what? Do they still get paid? Yes, they do. Do they still get state playoff games? As a matter of fact, they get more than the other officials because they're the best officials. So they get all the stuff that the self-focused officials get, but they don't do it by focusing on themselves. And the same thing come, is true when it comes to the gospel. The reason that we, we live these things out is for other people. And is it true that when we live according to what, what, what Paul tells Titus here, that we get a benefit out of that? That we have joyful lives? That we get blessings in our life? Absolutely. But is that the re only reason that we're to do it or even the main reason? No, I think what he's saying here, the main reason that we should do that because of the impact it has on other people. And when we live our lives with an outward focus rather than an inward focus, guess what? We're much more effective in taking the gospel to other people. And at the same time, we get all the benefits and we get the joy as well. So we get the best of both worlds. We get everything that we would have gotten if we were self-focused, but we get so much more. So the first thing he says here is that, that if we want to bring the kingdom near to others, we have to have an outward focus. Secondly, he says that it requires both lips and lives. Both lips and lives. Some of you have heard me talk before about a friend of mine named Bill. He's a guy I met at, at the gym where Mary and I worked out several years ago. And I'd actually seen him at another gym that we'd gone to before that. And, and so one day I struck up a conversation with Bill and really got to know him over a period of time. We began to work out together and actually became really good friends. But Bill had been through and, and had leukemia several different times, as a matter of fact. And, um, and I think I, I was a pretty good representative for Jesus Christ in his life. I mean, as we worked out together, I wasn't like the guys that cussed at the gym or things like that. We would go out to lunch, and I think I treated him well and was a good representative for Jesus Christ. But when his leukemia came back, I understood really quickly that just my life alone without testimony about Jesus was not enough. Some of you have probably heard this, this saying before that, um, that's up here on the screen right now that Dave's going to put up there. Be careful how you live. Your life may be the only Bible some people ever read. I suppose to a certain extent that is true. But that's not the entire story. And that wasn't the entire story in Bill's life. Bill needed me to be a good example, but he also needed me to tell him about Jesus Christ. And I had the opportunity to do that over time. I invited Bill. He came here to church. Matter of fact, a couple years ago, I think it was two, maybe three years ago, it seems like it's been a while, that he actually came here to church on Easter. And he very clearly heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as far as I know, from, from what I can tell, I don't know that Bill ever responded to the gospel. I pray that he did. I don't know that for sure, but I, I still have hope that one day I'll see him because I know he clearly heard the gospel several different times, and hopefully he saw it lived out in my life as well. But both are required. One or the other by themselves just isn't enough. We need lips and we need lives if we're going to communicate the gospel 
effectively to other people. Finally, bringing the kingdom of God near to others requires humility. Requires humility. I mean, let's face it. No, no matter how hard we work at living holy lives, we will never do it perfectly because we're sinful people. How we handle that when it happens in front, especially in front of non-believers, is going to go a long way towards either bringing the kingdom of God near to them or pushing them away from the kingdom of God. You see, if we begin to excuse our sin, make excuses for it or to explain it away, or even worse, what I've seen a lot of people do, turn around and say, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but you're a worse sinner. That's not a very effective way to bring the gospel to other people, is it? But if we will be humble, if we'll say, you know, you're right. When they point out something in our lives, they say, you know, you're right. I'm a sinner just like you. And, and if it wasn't for Jesus Christ in my life, I would be facing the same condemnation that every other sinner faces. And you say, I'm really sorry about that. I'm, I'm really working in my life not to, to live in a way that's inconsistent with the gospel. You know how much that will, how far that will go in helping other people to, to, to believe that the gospel is true and life-changing. You see, Jesus uses changed people to change lives. Do you understand what's at stake here? The eternal destiny of your friends and your family members and your co-workers and your neighbors. They are looking at all of our lives to see whether in fact the gospel that we claim to be true, the gospel that we claim to be so life-changing really has changed our lives. You know, Jesus could have chosen any way he wanted to communicate the gospel with the world around us. And for some reason, known only to him, he chose us. And he has entrusted to us the responsibility for not only proclaiming the gospel with our lips, but with our lives as well. So we need to take advantage of that. We need to make sure that our changed lives are being used by, by Jesus to change the lives of other people. So as we close this morning, I want to make this, this really practical for us. I want us to spend some time praying about these things. And you'll notice that in your sermon outline, I actually gave you a list of some things that you might want to consider praying as we have some time to pray over the, just the next few minutes. So let me just mention a couple of these real quick. First of all, if you've never experienced the life-changing gospel, the life-changing power of Jesus in your life, if you've never committed your life to Him, would you do that today? You can do that right there just as you sit in your seat and you, as you pray to Jesus. If you have some questions about that, some of our elders will be at the back and you can come as we, have our, as we sing here at the end and come talk to them more about that. That's the most important thing you can do. If you've never done that, that's key. But if you've done that, well, here's a couple other things. To, to thank Jesus for changing your life. How often do you do that? How often do you thank Jesus for changing your life? Ask God to reveal anything in your life that, that is causing others to do the things that we talked about today, to revile the Word of God or to, or to complain or to find fault with you or speak evil of you. Ask God. God to help make you more outwardly focused. And finally, ask Jesus to be, help you to be bold with your words as well as with your life. So would you go ahead and bow your head and pray? Just uh, let God lead you as you spend a few moments just, just praying through this. Pick out one or two things that, that God's leading you to pray today and go ahead and just spend some time in prayer with Him.